Good evening. And welcome again to God's house as he gathers us this evening for our Lenten Vesper. And before we begin, just a reminder that uh, this is our last one for the year. Um, next On Sunday, we start Holy Week with Palm Sunday, and that means next week, then we'll have worship on Thursday night, Monday, Thursday, with the Lord's Supper. And then on Friday evening, uh, for Good Friday, both those services will be at 6.30 on Thursday and on Friday. And with that, I invite you, as you're able to stand, for our call to worship. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, we have come together to devote ourselves to the worship of God, the word of God, prayers to God, and fellowship with one another. So the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. I love the Lord. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. Let your soul be at rest, for the Lord has been good to you. And what shall we offer to the Lord for all of his goodness to us? God, I confess that I have sinned against you this day. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts and words and deeds of which I am ashamed. But some is not only to you. I ask for your forgiveness for the sake of and in the name of Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore me that I may rest in peace. And by the mercy of God, we are restored by Jesus Christ, and in him, we are forgiven. We rest now in that peace and rise in the morning to serve him. Amen.
Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with patience and endurance the grace our God with us. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that we will not grow weary from his heart. Tonight, as we finish the Passion reading of Jesus, we focus on the cross of Jesus at Calvary. Now the soldiers had charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out of the city to a place called Skull Hill, in Hebrew, Golgotha. And, and as they led him away, they laid hold of Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, who was coming in from the country. On him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Following him was a great company of people and of women who bewailed and lamented him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. The days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never gave suck. Then they began to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things with the green tree, what will happen with the dry one? There were also two others, criminals, whom they had led along to be put to death with Jesus. When they came to the place called Golgotha, they gave him wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. It was the third hour, and there they crucified him. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Two criminals they crucified with him, one on his right and the other on his left, with Jesus in the middle. The scripture was then fulfilled which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they cast lots to divide his clothes and decide what they should each take. They made four parts, one for each soldier. There remained his tunic. This was without seam, woven in one piece from the top to the bottom, so they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but let us cast lots to decide who shall have it. The scripture was thus fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. These things the soldiers did, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Over his head was put the charge against him. Pilate wrote the notice to be put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, King of the Jews. This title was read by many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. The chief priests of the Jews then said to Pilate, You should not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. People stood by watching. Those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads, saying, Ha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross, that we may see and believe. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now. If you want some, for he said, I am the Son of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him wine and saying, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. The thieves also, who were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. And one of the criminals who hung there with him mocked him. He said, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are getting what we deserve for what we have done. But this man has done nothing wrong. 
And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now near to the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own house. Now about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Ele, Ele, lama sabachthani. And that means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of them that were standing there heard it, they said, He's calling for Elijah. After this, Jesus knew that all things were accomplished. Fulfilling the scripture, he said, I thirst. There was a jar of wine standing there. One of them ran immediately to get a sponge. He filled it with wine. He put it on a reed. He held it up to Jesus' mouth and gave it to him to drink. And the other said, Now wait. See if Elijah will come and save him. When Jesus had received the wine, he cried with a loud voice, It is finished. And he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion who stood facing him saw how he died, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. All the people who had gathered to see the sight when they saw what had happened turned away, beating their breasts. Those who had known him stood at a distance, also, and as also the women who had followed him from Galilee. Among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and the younger of Joseph, and Salome the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now it was the day of preparation before the Sabbath, and this was Passover Sabbath. Therefore, so that the bodies should not remain on the crosses during the Sabbath, the Jews asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies removed. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. One who saw it is our witness, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, that you also may believe. These things were done, that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another of the scripture that says, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. By this time evening had come. A respected member of the council, Joseph of Arimathea, was one who was looking for the kingdom of God, and a good and righteous man who had not consented to the purpose of the Jews. He was a disciple of Jesus secretly, for he feared the Jews. Now he took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was astonished that he could be dead already. He called for the centurion and asked him whether Jesus was already dead. And when he was assured by the centurion that it was so, Pilate granted Joseph the corpse, and he commanded that it be given over to him. Joseph brought fine linen and came and took the body of Jesus. Nicodemus came also, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. It was he who had first come to Jesus by night. They then took the body of Jesus, wrapped it in linen cloths and with spices, as, a very, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, where no one had ever been buried. Joseph laid the body in his own new tomb, which had been hewn out in the rock, and rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb, and departed. 
Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Joseph, were sitting there opposite of the tomb, and they saw where he was laid. Then they returned, and they prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day they rested, according to the commandment. On the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees went together to Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that this impostor said, while he was still alive, After three days I will rise again. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day to stop his disciples from coming and stealing him and saying to the people, He has risen from the dead, making the final deception worse than the first. So Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go and make it as secure as you know how. So they went and they made the tomb secure. Then they sealed the stone and set a watch. This is the passion of our Lord. Tonight, Psalm 103, the first first 14 verses, based on the theme of grace. We pray this responsibly. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and the name of Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? satisfies your desires with good things, so that your root youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, full of anger and long He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, 
so great is his love for those who fear him. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. This is his word. So this evening as we gather for these Psalms of Lent, as I mentioned before, we're going to focus on, on this Psalm 103, and this is a theme I want us to think about, the word grace. And it's a marvelous word, grace. It's a, a, one of the best untainted words we still have in English. We get so many words from it. Gratitude, gracious, congratulations, all of it implying the idea of, of a gift. In fact, the word grace itself literally means undeserved favor. An undeserved favor, a gift that you do not deserve. I like to tell kids when I'm doing catechism, we talk about this idea of grace and mercy and how they're different. And I give the example of, of um, driving. And you know there's that section right on going out of town as you're going towards uh, Bloomfield um, where the, the RV campground starts. It goes from 55 to 45, so slow down. I don't always slow down. Sometimes I find myself getting caught. I'm still going 62 through there. So I'm just waiting for the day when the police take me. And you know what I would deserve, right? If that happened, I would deserve driving 62 and a 45. I deserve a ticket. I deserve, right? I deserve that ticket. That's what I earned. Now, if he doesn't give me a ticket, but gives me a warning, that's mercy. I don't get what I deserve. That's mercy. And so then I ask, well, what would grace be? This is what grace would be. The policeman stops me for speeding and gives me Green Bay Packer tickets. <laughs> That's grace. An undeserved, unexpected gift. That's grace. That's what God is known to be a giver of. And, and David, David was a receiver of that gift. And, and so when David received that undeserved kindness, when he received that <laughs> unexpected gift from God, it led David to, to praise. That's where the psalm begins, with praise. Praise the Lord, O my soul, O my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and then he says why. Why? Because he does not forget all of his benefits. Do not forget all of God's benefits. Benefits. Gifts. Benefits. Grace. Things that are not deserved. And then he begins to list off in his praise these benefits that are not deserved. And he starts with the very, the very essential. Who forgives all of our sins. Who does not count our failures against us. He heals our diseases. We praise the one who gives us the benefit of redeeming our life from the pit. And from the crown to you with love and compassion. You're, you're a sinner, but you're crowned as a king with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things. It's not until there that he begins to define the gifts of grace like breath and, and food and house, the good things, so that your youth is renewed like that of the eagles. David is focusing in on this God who is gracious, who is giving. And it leads him to praise. And then finally comes this phrase. For the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Do you know how David knows that's how God acts and that's the character of God? David knows that because that's exactly what God said about himself. These are the very words that God spoke to Moses on the mountain when he passed by Moses, when Moses said, I want to see you, God. God said, you can't see me, but you can, you can be in the edge, and I'll pass by my presence, and you'll see my backside. And as God is passing by Moses, he says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God who is slow to <coughs> anger and abounding in love. That's God's self-description of himself. The God of all grace, and David embraced it. David knew it. And so David confessed it. And then he tells us what this means for the believer. What does this mean for me, David, he says. 
Well, it means this. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. David deserved a ticket. A ticket to hell. So do you. So do I. For I confess that I am a most miserable sinner, confessing to thee all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended thee, and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. A ticket to hell is what I deserve. But he doesn't treat us that way. Because he's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He doesn't repay us according to our guilt. He's the God who in grace does the unimaginable. But he is. And this is the image that David gets of forgiveness, this God who forgives. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is this compassionate love, this grace for us. For as far as the east is from the west, what has he done? He has removed our transgressions from us. There isn't a place that we can go to find our sins when they're forgiven by God. Why? He's removed them as far as the east is from the west. It's the gift of grace that you and I live under and live in. But it wasn't cheap. Oh, for us it's free. That's what grace is, right? Grace is a gift. But what you pay for the last gift you got? Nothing. Because it was a gift. But somebody paid the price. And it comes also, the gift of grace from God comes with a price. Not that we have to pay. But this psalm directs us to the gift that Jesus came to pay. Forgiveness is achieved. The price is paid not by you, not by me, but by Jesus. And this is the way that Paul talks about it. That God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. So Jesus doesn't have any sin. That means Jesus doesn't deserve a ticket to hell. He has never failed. He never got caught because he never did wrong. He does not deserve the ticket to hell. But on that cross, for six hours on that Friday, God is making Jesus to be sin for us. There's an exchange going on. Our sins placed upon Jesus. Our sins transferred to Jesus. And so when he becomes sin for us, he takes our ticket to hell. He does. Not the descent into hell to declare the victory. He descends into hell because he's separated from God. Not, not the descent into hell that we say in the creed. That's a victory celebration. But the separation of God. The ticket of being separated from God. He endures that so that we might what? Receive the approval of God. Who deserves God's approval? Only one person who ever lived does. That's Jesus, who didn't have sin. But that's what we get in exchange. That's better than Green Bay Packer tickets. That's even better than Final Four basketball tickets. That's a ticket to heaven. That's a ticket to heaven. That's a ticket to live in the presence of God that you did not deserve, that you did not pay the price for. But he did. And we know that most clearly from the word that he cried from the cross. Ele, ele, lama sabachthani. That's his own language. And the translators of the Bible tells us what that means. My God, my God, Jesus cries out, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why did you give me a ticket to hell? Well, the why is because in his body he's bearing our sin. Because that's what he becomes on the cross. Was his death painful? Yes. Was it agonizing? Well, of course. But that's not what makes it saving. Two other guys died the same way the same day. What makes his death saving is he takes the ticket to hell 
abandoned by God, forsaken by his Father, because he becomes us on that cross. So we'll never be forsaken. So that our ticket is a ticket to the Father's house, where Jesus is preparing a place for each of us. He'll come back and take us to be with him where he is, and we know the way. The way is straight through Jesus. And because that's what grace is, and that's how grace is won for us, it's no wonder that David praised. And it's no wonder that that's how I'm going to ask you to end this meditation. To join me in these words of praise one more time. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of our sins. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward to gather the gifts and the offerings that we bring before our Lord as, as tokens and symbols of our sacrifice to him.
together in prayer, we entrust our lives to the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night, for into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. And Heavenly Father, you have loved the world in such a way that you gave your Son. You gave your Son to free us from all that entangles us, from sin, from death, and he did so by his obedient death on the cross. Lord God, we confess that without that saving love, we would be lost forever. So we praise you and thank you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear And God, we pray for all of those who carry heavy burdens in life. We lift before you tonight the sick and the chronically ill. We pray for the depressed and the lonely those torn by personal conflicts and relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and for all who fear the terrors of life with a heavy heart. God, grant them your peace and in your mercy be their guardian and their friend, their comfort and their hope. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And today we pray for all of those who care for others, for doctors, for nurses, for social workers, pastors, teachers, counselors, for all caring friends, for all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and who stand beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O oh Lord, and do not let them become weary in doing good. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you are the creator of all things. You powerfully brought this world into existence and care for it. So tonight we come to you and pray for precipitation. We pray for snow or for rain to fill the lakes and the rivers of our land, to moisten the soil, that we might be restored with favorable weather, and that our land and our waters would be preserved. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Now into your hands, Lord Jesus, we commend ourselves and all that we pray for as we trust in your mercy. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives, who rules with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And Lord, remember us today in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. Now may the God of peace, who through the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. Now go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.